Football season always has special meaning in the Johnson house. Growing up, I remembered I wanted to play football. But those were the days before Coach Leonard brought the Rochester dynasty into existence. And so we didn't have football at Rochester in those days. And neither of the colleges that I went to, whether it be Bradley University or uh, Lincoln Christian College, had football teams. So I couldn't realize that dream or that desire uh, in college either, if, even if I was qualified or, or capable of playing. So like most people, I... Uh, live my football fantasies vicariously by watching football on television. <laughs> and then, like a lot of people, being the Monday morning quarterbacks, second-guessing all that the players and all that the coaches decided to do who were on the field. Now, back in 1985, my guess is there were a lot of people who were probably Chicago Bears fans. I remember watching Walter Payton, Jim McMahon, Mike Singletary, and, of course, William the Refrigerator Perry, and I just, you know, they transformed Sundays for me, okay? Watching them play and watching them dominate was just amazing. I remember I really liked Coach Ditka. And I may have told you the story uh, before about how I got to spend literally two hours uh, in a room with Coach Ditka when we were in Connecticut. But being the idiot that I am, I lost all the pictures on my phone uh, on the way home. So you just got to believe me that that really did happen, okay? But I really did get to spend two hours with Coach Ditka, and it was pretty amazing. It was when we moved to Indianapolis, though, that my allegiances changed from the Chicago Bears to the Indianapolis Colts, and of course, a different Peyton, okay? A Peyton whose last name is Manning instead of Walter Peyton. And I remember watching uh, he and Coach Dungy, okay, in the RCA Dome, okay, long before the Lucas Oil Stadium. Uh, it was my first experience watching football games live, I don't know if you've ever been to a live football game or not, but they're much better on television, okay? <laughs> they really are. You can see more, you know, it's stuff that you miss, you actually get to see again and again and again. Uh, you know, it's just, it was just an amazing experience. When we moved to Connecticut, I think our family was the only family living in all of New England who rooted for the Indianapolis Colts, okay? And we did so because we didn't like Tom Brady, and we didn't like the New England Patriots, but it was pretty exciting, was it not, amidst their 200 or so Super Bowl, Bowl victories that they had, that the Colts did get to play the Bears back in 2007 for uh, the Super Bowl against Tom, and, and, uh, and they win. People at the church, okay, I got this, this jersey uh, after that game, and I wore it, I think, almost every Sunday for a year, okay? Uh, people got really tired of seeing the Indianapolis Colts jersey uh, during the uh, games in, or doing, during seasons in New England. But you know what's really funny, how things change? Last year's Super Bowl, okay? Do you remember who played in last year's Super Bowl? I rooted for the old guy, Tom Brady. <laughs> Can you believe that? I rooted against him for so many years, and, let, and yet last year I was rooting for him to beat Kansas City and Patrick Mahomes. So, you know, I share all of this worthless information with you about our love for football because I think it helps make the point that I really want us to remember this morning. And that is that there's no one person, there's no one team, there's nobody. Whether they play football or whether they've been or there are, they are a president of our country, there's nobody that can unite us long term. If you, I, I invited people to wear jerseys this morning, and what I'm learning is there just aren't too many football fans <laughs> in South Fork. However, there are a couple. Thank you, Barb, for wearing yours. Um, my guess is if I had invited you to wear a shirt of your favorite politician, that might have been different, but we may have had to call security, okay, uh, just to try to keep the peace. You know, even as a small church, what I know is we could never be united even on the fact that Pepsi products are better than Coke. Am I right? I'm not right. Okay. <laughs> See, we just can't get there. We live in such a divided world. Remember this. There's absolutely nothing that can unite us except Jesus Christ. We might have some good debates over what was Jesus' most important teachings or the most important things that he did, but really the only thing, the only person who's ever going to unite us is Jesus. 
We're in the second week of a series of messages out of Ephesians 4, which, as I mentioned last week, happens to be just one of two chapters in the whole New Testament that really emphasize unity within the church. And last week we looked at how the Apostle Paul told us that we had been called by God to be united as a church. It's not something the church gets to vote on. It's been a mandate ever since the beginning of the church, back in the days of Acts, that Jews and Gentiles, people from all different groups, would come together and there would be unity within the church. That expectation has not changed. But you know, if you go back to even the first century after the church began about 40 AD or something like that, 33, 34 AD, if you go back even to the first century after that, there's all kinds of church fathers who write and plea for unity to be in the church. Because even back then, even when the church was so young, there was still division. There were still things that they could not come together on. Unity isn't easy. And so we have to work at it as a church and as a group of churches who carry the name of Jesus Christ. Howard Hendricks is one of my favorite Bible scholars and He said this about, I I agree with him. He says, you know, many of us in the church are like porcupines, trying to huddle together on a bitter cold night to keep each other warm. But we continually poke and hurt each other the closer we get. Is that not true? In most churches, that's exactly what happens. And since things haven't changed since the early days and and last century when when Hendricks wrote that, I think what we're finding as a church is that we're finding creative new ways in order to divide Christ's church. So what can we do? What can we do to stay true to that calling that we talked about last week? What can we do so that Satan isn't the only one when he looks at the church, smiles? Christian author Philip Yancey suggested, I think, one opinion or one option. He said this, my identity in Christ is more important than my identity as an American or as a Coloradan or as a white male or as a Protestant. Church is the place where I celebrate that new, the new, that new identity and work on it in the midst of people who have many differences but share this one thing in common. We are charged to live out a kind of an alternative society before the eyes of the, of the watching world. A world that is increasingly moving towards tribalism and division. If our identity is in Christ, then who should we be looking at? Where should our eyes be? In our text today that we're going to pick up on where we left off last week, Paul begins by stating some areas within the church of which we should be or we almost have to be united. I want to look at those with you this morning. And I want you to notice how the triune God, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the triune God are involved in this process of unity In the church, Ephesians 4, verse 4, he says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and and God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Look at that statement, and what it says is, I think, it's God the Father who called us to be a part of this family we call the church. It's his son, Jesus, who provides the faith, hope, and baptism. And it's the Holy Spirit, then, who allows us to be the one body, the one church that has existed over the centuries and all around the world. Each and every part of God is involved in the fact that there could be unity or is necessary for there to be unity in the church. Think about God for a second. You've got God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three different beings, and yet what? They are united. 
And so the fact that they model what unity looks like and they're involved in the unity that needs to take place in the church, I think is only a given. And that's why Paul starts this passage in the way that he does. But today what I want to do is to look specifically or to highlight how Jesus unites us because that's who our eyes are on. And the first fact that we can look at today is that Christ unites us as a conqueror. From our text today, I think it's, it, it, we can see that Christ unites us as a conqueror. You know, throughout time, there have been men and women who have united nations together by what? Going in and conquering other nations. They've gone in and they've just taken them over and said, now you follow me. And people have done that. The Romans were really well known for doing that, as were the Greeks. And so I think that's probably why Paul uses some of the imagery that he does here. And I confess to you last week, I've had trouble with understanding this, but I think I finally got a handle on it, and I want to share it with you today. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. Paul says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. We'll come back to that. That's, that's a, just a, there's so much picture. There's so much meaning in that verse alone. And then in parentheses, Paul says, in saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He also descended. He who descended is also the one who also ascended far above all of the heavens that might fill all things. That he might fill all things. Let me unpack this as I've tried to put this together in my mind. And maybe if, if you're having any confusion with this, it'll help you as well. What, what Paul does is he quotes the first part of Psalm chapter 68, verse 18, when he's talking about the ascending and descending. And if you look at that psalm, it's talking about a victory that the nation of Israel had. And it talks about the descending and ascending. You also, I think, need to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that describes what is known as a triumphal procession. Look with me real quick at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Paul says to the Corinthians, thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in a triumphal procession. And through us spreads the fragrance, fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Triumphal processions, do you understand what those were back in the days of the Roman Empire? Art Evans wrote a, a, an article in the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia that I think describes it well. Let me read it to you. He says this, a triumphal procession in, in Rome was a magnificent procession in honor of a victorious general. And the highest military distinction that anyone could obtain. It was granted by the Senate only to the one who had held the office of dictator, council, praetor, and only after a decisive victory in the complete subjugation of a province. In Rome, triumph was victor in Rome, the triumph, the victorious general entered the city in a chariot drawn by four horses. He was crowned with a laurel, having a scepter in one hand and a branch of a laurel in the other. He was preceded by the Senate and the magistrates, musicians, the spoils of his victory. And followed by the captives who were in fetters. And then the army who marched in order. He goes on to describe how they would march up to the capital. This procession, this huge celebration would go to the capital. Then there would be sacrifices made to the Roman gods. And this emperor, this, this, this conquering hero would then be given special status within the nation. In Ephesians 4, Paul uses the idea that it was Jesus who descended from heaven. And when he died, he even went to the lower regions, the abode of the dead, Hades. And who was in charge of Hades? Satan. But when Jesus came back to life, what did he do? He not only conquered death, he conquered Satan. He conquered all of Satan's allies, all of his enemy, I mean, all of his uh, demons and spirits and everybody who supported Satan's work. So can you see in your mind what Paul's suggesting here? There was this glorious triumphal pro procession led by Jesus. And there was Satan and all of his cronies in shackles being led up 
as Christ ascended. What a beautiful picture of what Jesus has done for us. He's conquered our enemy. And we can unite around that fact. You know what? It also goes as part of that procession that the conquering hero would share some of the spoils of the, of the victories that they had. And so the second way that Christ, I think, unites us is that he unites us as a gift giver. You see, during that procession, what would happen is that the, 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 the person who had conquered would start giving away things that he took as the spoils from whichever country he had conquered, and he gave it to the people so that they could be endowed to him, and their loyalty would remain with him. Paul wrote in Ephesians 4 that, the, that Jesus gives us gifts. As that conqueror, then, he's united us, but then he's also given us certain things to help maintain that unity. Verse 7 says it all begins with his grace. Let's read verse 7 and then jump down to verse 11. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. See, he, he won that battle. He's in this glorious, glorious triumphant procession. And he just starts giving out his grace. But then he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the, to the unity of the faith. Has that happened yet? And of the knowledge of the Son of God. To mature manhood. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Last week we talked about how we have to forgive one another's faults. The only way we can do that is through God's grace. A church without grace is a church that will never be united. But in addition to that grace, he gave specific leadership. He gave the gift of leaders whose purpose it was to build up the church so that there could be unity of the faith. You know the categories. You've probably looked at this passage many times. There are the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherd teachers. And I hope that we understand that the word apostle simply means one who is sent with specific orders. Now, when you think of apostle, you probably think of the 12 or maybe the 13 or 14, if you want to include Matthias and, and, and Saul and those, or Paul. When you talk about apostles, we definitely are talking about them. But what if there were people that God gave a message to and specific orders to who didn't live in that apostolic age? Could they still be considered apostles? There's a lot of people who think that that could be the case. They're not as important as the 12, obviously, who had that personal encounter with Jesus himself. But you know what? There are people, I think, who do apostolic work even today to bring about unity in the church. They go places where no one else has ever been. And God blesses them because he sent them on that specific mission. So apostles is, is a gift that I think God still may use because we haven't achieved unity yet. The second thing is prophets. Prophets. Now, were prophets just people who lived back in the Old, Old Testament days or, or, or in the New Testament? Well, you know what? The definition of a prophet was someone who spoke through the Holy Spirit. Prophets never spoke on their own. The Apostle Peter talked about that in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. He says, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were called along by the Holy Spirit. Jesus gave gifts of prophecy so that the church could hear a message from the Holy Spirit so that they could maintain unity. We've probably heard about a lot of, a lot of prophecies nowadays. We've heard a lot of people make prophecies about things that have happened or will happen. But you know the key, I think, especially when somebody prophesies about the church is to ask the question, are they promoting unity 
in the body of Christ worldwide. Because if they're not, then that gift is not from Jesus. So you have apostles, you have prophets, then you have evangelists. We know that evangelists are those who have this special gift of being able to communicate the gospel in a way that people can understand it and respond to it. Not everyone has that gift, but thank God there are some who do and who use it. Then we come down to shepherds and teachers. Most scholars think this is really talking about the same office, the same gift. It's the person who serves as a teaching elder in a local church. You call them pastors. You call them ministers. It's pretty much what my primary role is here at South Fork. It's to teach the church, to build up the church, and to maintain unity. I hope I'm doing that. I hope God continues to bless this church with that kind of unity. So the question is, This is a list of spiritual gifts that we oftentimes talk about when we're looking at all the spiritual gifts that God has given to the church. And we think, well, why did Paul include these in this particular chapter? Because he's talking about unity. And he's saying, here are four special roles that I want to be used in the church in order to promote unity. Paul gives us a third description of Jesus that helps us maintain unity. And it's this. Christ unites us as the head of a functioning body. Before we look at scripture, let me just ask this question. Has anybody ever heard of Fruta, Colorado? Anybody ever been to Fruta? Colorado. It's, it's kind of a metropolitan area of Grand Junction. It's over by uh, the Utah border. Maybe if you haven't heard of Fruta, maybe you've heard of their most famous resident ever. His name was Mike. Anybody heard of Mike from Fruta? Really? There's a festival after, after him every August 27th. Here's the deal. Back in 1945, Mike was a chicken running around in the backyard of Lloyd Olson, who took an ax to him trying to cut off his head so that the family could have dinner the next day. The only problem was that Olson didn't hit the right spot, and when he cut off his head, he left enough of Mike's brain that he lived for 18 months. Here's a picture of Mike the Headless Chicken. He became a sideshow from 45 to 47. And you think I made this up, and you know, this isn't Photoshop. This is, this is real, okay? You can look it up, and... Um, Having grown up on a chicken farm, I guarantee you that Mike was the exception, not the rule, especially when my mom cut off their heads. A chicken without a head doesn't live very long, does it? The same is true for a church. Without Jesus being our head, life is going to be very erratic. It's going to be very sporadic. Paul describes it this way, verse 14. Jesus is the head so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. With Jesus as our head, there's stability. We can communicate the truth in love, and we will grow. What would it be like to be a part of a church where Jesus wasn't the head? Or what if there was a church where everybody wanted to be the head instead of Jesus? I think those churches would be like what Paul describes there in that nautical metaphor. He talks about how you're a ship tossed to and fro. You're over here one day, you're over here the next day. I think it's what we're seeing in a lot of churches nowadays who are buying into some man-made theories and, and doctrines. There's so many churches who are just preaching what people want to hear. I think it's important that we look 
at things that the world is saying, cultural things like critical theory and, and what's happening, but we look at them through a biblical lens that Jesus has given us and modeled for us. Because if we don't know what's going on around us, we're kind of like Mike the Headless Chicken, aren't we? We really don't know what's going on. We don't know how to respond. We don't know how to speak to those who are so lost and who need Christ. There are so many passages that we could have looked at today talking about a functioning church. We're going to save that for another day. Where each person who is a part of this called community needs to do their part. But today, I just want us to focus on Jesus. And how he's conquered sin. How he's given us gifts. And how he is now the head who leads his church. I pray for those churches, and I hope you do too, who have lost their focus that they'll look back and look to Jesus as being the one who's giving them the direction and the stability that they need. Because I guarantee you this, this church, nor any other church, will ever be united by what football jersey or what baseball jersey, what politician, whatever we follow, will never be united unless our eyes or on Jesus. Let's prepare for a time of communion where we celebrate that victory that he's given us over sin.